Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is Eli. I'm a recovered alcoholic. I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous since 1991. Um, I've been clean and sober since June 4th of the year 2000. Just to kind of give you an idea of kind of alcoholic I am. <laughs> I'd just like to start off by saying thank you for everyone who had any part in my invitation to come out here to share my experience. This means a lot to me. Um, this is this is a privilege for me. This is an honor to be able to go somewhere because someone asked me to and uh, share my experience. Um, a lot of people this weekend that I'm meeting for the very first time. Um, I don't know if it's this town, this city, this state, or uh, this conference, but there's a lot of love that I've experienced just in the last two days. Um, I feel welcome. I feel invited. I feel a part of, and I've never been here before in my life. So thank you for that. Being a chronic alcoholic isn't something I would wish on anyone. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that, for me, I battled with for a long time to, you know, to really truly understand what it is that's wrong with me and what it is that I must participate in in order to get well, in order to recover. And... Uh, it's becoming less of a burden now that I, you know, um, have had a pass through the steps, the obsession gets expelled, don't think about drinking the way I once did, and then I get a new set of problems. I get a new set of circumstances that make me willing to re-examine my position and my place with this 12-step process and my position with the 12-step practice that I've been shown and that I've been given. And so I'm held accountable now. And... I appreciate the men and women that have come before me that live this thing, have been exposed to it from the same way I got exposed to it was from a book, and (coughs) who (coughs) have experience with the workings and the mechanics of the 12 steps. That means a lot to me because I'm at a place now with my condition where I have to be able to grow. I can't stay very long on what I done or have experienced up to this point, because when I'm not growing, I begin to decay. And and, and you'll see it in my personal relationships. You'll see it in the way um, you see it the way I I am at work. You'll see it in the way I treat my family. You'll see it in in the way I treat new men and women that I meet in this fellowship. And so it's better for me when I'm growing, and it's better for everyone else that comes in contact with me when I'm growing. So I am forever grateful for the men and women who continue to practice and are diligent with the principles of this fellowship. And just thank you. Simply put, uh, alcohol saved my life. Um, When I discovered alcohol and the way it made me feel, I was about 11 years old. I could tell you about Grandpa feeding me beer when I was, you know, a little toddler, but I drank on my own by the time I was about 11. And uh, by the time by the time I was 16 and a half years old, I was sitting in seats like this. You know, I was already in the rooms taking newcomer chips. Um, so I didn't have a, a huge drinking career the first time I come in and get exposed to this thing that I thought was Alcoholics Anonymous, which what I thought was conferences, conventions, marathons, and meetings. And um, I'm in a place now where my gratitude is shown for my appreciation of those things, but more so what came out of a book that has its title, Alcoholics Anonymous. I was written back in the 19th, written back in the 1930s, and not ever being exposed to that the first time around, you know, going to meetings, taking chips. I had no idea how sick I was, and I had no idea that I was going to get drunk again, just like a lot of people do. You know, most people don't take into consideration that 
because of this condition that there's no cure for, because of this condition that there's only one way out that we found that works, if I'm not participating in that, then I'm just waiting to get drunk again. And it's only a matter of time because of the, all the different components of this disease. You know, the physical part is that I can't control how much I drink when I drink. That's the bottom line. I never had. Um, at 11 years old, the blackouts came pretty fast. Uh, you know, mental institutions, that showed up within a couple of years. Jail, that, that came just a couple of years after drinking. All these circumstances, situations, those things do not spell alcoholism. But some of us that suffer from alcoholism do have those experiences. So this is probably the only place that I get to talk about some of these things that I've experienced. You know, some of us drink so much when you separate us from, from alcohol or, or other mind object substances. You know, I can only go a few days before my hands start to shake and tremble. And uh, by somewhere usually between day five and day ten, I'll have visual and auditorial hallucinations from DTs, from delirium tremens. And I'll see things and hear things that are not real. And uh, a lot of times I'm having these experiences while I'm in uh, psychiatric hospitals and mental institutions while a professional doctor is evaluating me, you know. And um, they don't have anything to go by other than their experiences as, as educated men and women. And they have a big old thick book of synthetic knowledge, the DSM. They got one, two, three, I think they're working on number four or five now. And... Uh, my symptoms that I'm showing resemble a lot of the conditions or illnesses that are in this book. And so they'll, they'll, they'll treat me for racing thoughts. They'll treat me for having visual and auditory hallucinations. They'll treat me for having mood swings. One day I'm happy and I'm okay. Next day I'm mad and angry or sad. I'll go up and I'll go down. I'll, you know, my thoughts will go this way and that way and round in the circles, round in circles, racing thoughts, just day in and day out. And some, you know, a lot of times I can't sleep too well at night. A lot of times my appetite's not too great. And so what these doctors are going to do is, help me based on what they think they know about my condition because to them it might look like schizophrenia if I'm seeing things and hearing things that aren't there. If I'm having a lot of mood swings, it might seem like to them like I'm bipolar. Or if I come in and I'm not talking to people, maybe I'm a little psychotic and I'm, I'm just in a really dark place, uh, they might treat me for manic depression. And so what happens is I take medication and uh, eventually... I'm, I'm released from these institutions and these facilities after 48-hour hold or 72-hour hold or a 14-day hold or a 21-day hold. And for me, what happens is I get loaded again. And I didn't get an explanation to any of that until I got exposed to the textbook of Alcox Anonymous real thoroughly 10 years ago. And there's a description of what I suffer from in that book. And um, I've met men and women in the past 10 years that have found the same solution. And so for those men and women, I'm grateful that I've formed, I guess you'd call them friendships. You know, to me, they're a little bit more serious than that. They're, um, they could be like life packs, you know, about practicing the design for a living or with the lack of attention to detail and a lack of participation, in the 12-step process, they could be like death packs. You know, it's like, you don't ask me qu any questions to make me feel uncomfortable, and I won't ask you any questions to make you feel uncomfortable. And we'll just go out, out in the world and pretend everything's okay because we're not drinking or using today. And our life's gotten better. We got jobs and clothes and place to live. And I'm in a different, different, different place because the only thing that I appreciate more is how my insides are. And all the outside stuff, for me, all that stuff usually comes last. And um, just to back up a little bit, to kind of tell you how I ended up in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at 16 and a half years old, I'd already been in jail, already been in the institutions, and uh, I could not control my drinking. And uh, I came into meetings and I listened to war stories, and, and I identified to a lot of them, a lot of them, a lot of them I did. Um... Some of them I couldn't. I was only 16 and a half years old, so I couldn't relate to, let's say, a, a service veteran talking about his experience with combat overseas, you know, experiencing a theater of war somewhere in a foreign country. Because none of the, you know, none of the shootings or the gunfights that I was involved with, none of them were sanctioned by the United States Armed Forces. <laughs> so I, I couldn't really identify with someone who had purpose with, you know, being in, in gun battles. My, mine was always selfish and self-centered, motivated, you know, just about what I did to feel good or to look good or to be a part of and connect to it. 
And so, you know, I'm from California, I'm from Los Angeles, and, you know, there's a lot of actors out there. And I don't know if it's culturally, but a lot of us, a lot of us pretend. A lot of us uh, can act as if we know what we're doing, act as if we know what we're talking about. A lot of times it's just a show. And I didn't really see any of this until much, 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 much later until I get exposed to the 12-step process and take a look at inventory. And uh, the book is real clear. You know, it talks about me putting on a show. I'm going to say and do things in order to create an idea of who I think you should believe I am. And most of the time, I know it's not real, but I can't stop living in the show. I have to be a certain way and talk a certain way and act a certain way. And, it, and it's all just part of the show. And a lot of times, even in the past 10 years of my sobriety, I participated in that, putting on a, a type of show. Um, the things I did as part of my show before I got here, I didn't realize I was in character or acting. Because, you know, they, it, was, it was real guns, real bullets, real blood, and I've done real time. And none of it was pretending to me. It was who I was. It was the character that I'd become and, and developed in order to maybe to survive or just to feel like everything's okay. I had talked about alcohol and how it saved my life. But what I mean by that, when I was 11 years old, I was just very, very suicidal. Some, some kids are, you know, just happy living life. I wasn't. Um, I didn't like being young. I didn't, uh, I didn't like... Uh, the way I was treated by my peers and my friends. I mean, you know, as young people, as, as you know, if you look back to elementary school, ju ju uh, junior high or high school, there's peer groups, there's cliques, there's this and that. And even amongst your people that you see every day or that are part of your little clique or your little world, we're even mean to each other. We talk about each other's mother, we talk about how we dress, we oh, look at your big ears, or look, we're kind of nitpicky and, and uh, abusive to each other. And a lot of us have formed relationships like that, you know. I mean, I got friendships today that people I've grown up with for over 30 years, and, you know, that's just the way how we spoke to each other. That's just how we, we talk to each other. We're pretty uh, abusive to each other. And um, I just didn't like any of that. I had really very thin skin. I Things bothered me. Um, and I just acted as if I was tough. And so I used humor as a way to uh, defend myself. I uh, School was pretty easy. Grades weren't a big deal, so that was one way that I could uh, separate myself from others. Um, I got, I, I remember manipulating my parents into paying me for my grades. I got 10 bucks an A and 5 bucks a B, and then later on, when I started drinking at age 11, that's just how I kind of like financed my little, my little drinking adventures, and then of course, shoplifting was part of that, when I ran out of money, and then stealing and manipulating and conniving and things like that. And not everybody has to go through that. Some people have unlimited resources, or, you know, just have access to things. I did not. So I had to kind of plan and manipulate and scheme in order to get more. And I always needed more. I couldn't control my drinking from the very start. But it allowed me to breathe. And, and it allowed me to be okay with my circumstances, with my environment. I remember during that time, parents were getting a divorce. Once I started drinking, I wasn't sweating it anymore. I didn't care that dad was going to leave. Um, I liked this freckle-faced girl that lived a few blocks away. It didn't matter to me that she didn't like me back. Because you know what? After I started drinking, she really wasn't that cute anyway. <laughs> so I got to see how my perception changed immediately once I started drinking. And once I started drinking, I realized why other people drank. If they were feeling what I felt when I drank, then I understood why they drank. And so that's what kept me drinking is the way it made me feel. There was an effect. And it was like, it was, it was a spiritual experience. There's no other way for me to, to coin it or, or to, to describe it. It was a spiritual experience that I had with alcohol at age 11. And then it, it, it kind of turned on me. It, the control wasn't really there as far as uh, maybe, the, I was controlling as far as I didn't drink every day in the beginning. It might have been a, a weekend thing or every week, every other weekend thing. And then, you know, within six months to a year, it was every weekend. And then the weekend started on Thursday. And then pretty soon it was... Uh, I'd be in a uh, sixth period, you know, in, in uh, junior high or something, and uh, the obsession would come and get me and tell me that I needed to leave. I couldn't finish the rest of the day at school. And when the obsession came and says, let's, let's get out of here, let's go do our thing, I'd raise my hand, ask if I'd go to the bathroom, and pff, off I'd go, hop the fence and go pimp a beer at the, at the nearest liquor store and, and uh, get, get a, catch my buzz and then go home, go to the block, meet with everyone else, put a few bucks in the hat, pass it, have someone's older brother go score some something to drink, and then later on, once I was a little tipsy, I'd uh, ask someone to drive me to the store, and then I'd just begin my shoplifting and, and, and theory for more. And uh, so I couldn't control in the beginning, and 
just to kind of explain that, it's uh, something that the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous refers to as the phenomenon of craving. I didn't hear anyone talk about the phenomenon of craving at the first meetings I went to. I went to meetings for a long time. I went to meetings sometimes more than once a day, and I went to meetings six or seven days a week. No one talked about the phenomenon of craving, and no one talked about that if I'm an alcoholic, I have a cra uh, an allergy that manifests itself in my body once I take that first drink. No one talked about that. No one talked about it at the meetings that I went to. So it's kind of like my responsibility and my duty now to talk to Eli when he's 16 and a half years old and he's sitting in a room and he doesn't know why he's an alcoholic. So if you're anything like Eli was when he's 16 and a half years old, the next time you drink, you will not be able to stop once you start if you're a chronic alcoholic. You may not be, and that's the only hope and that's the only thing that can get you off the hook. Hopefully you don't have what I have. But when I drink, I can't stop. And I'll give you an example of what that looks like from my experience. When I was eight and a half months clean and sober, separated from booze and everything else, the longest that I'd ever been before. You know, I mean, I, I love chips. You know, when I, a 30-day chip, I'd never seen anyone take a 30-day chip before when I first started to come around. I didn't understand what that meant until, you know, I started to kind of just watch. And that meant that person hasn't used anything or drank anything in 30 days. <laughs> And I got to the point, like I said, it wasn't an every weekend thing. It didn't, you know, wasn't all the time until it was all the time. Until it, I needed it just to breathe, just to feel normal, just to get out of the house. When I finally rolled out of bed at, you know, noontime or one o'clock when I wasn't in school and whatnot. But when I see people take chips, to me that was powerful. And to me, even today, ten years later, there's nothing more powerful to me than, than a 30-day chip. If you're a chronic alcoholic. How do you go 30 days and nights without drinking anything? If you're a chronic alcoholic, so to me, that's a powerful thing. Then 60 days, that was just, wow, 90 days, six months, nine months. And then I, to tell you how green I was, I didn't know anything about anything when I first came around. I seen people celebrate birthdays. I didn't know what the hell that was. It was like, I was like, wow, this is kind of like a family-oriented place, I guess. You guys celebrating each other's birthday and <laughs> kind of tripped me out, you know, so I, that's pretty cool, I thought, you know, and I'm, I'll, I'll just let them know that I'm an Aquarius. And uh, my, my birthday is the 10th of February, and I love chocolate. So, you know, at that time of year, I roll around, we'll be good, and get my chocolate cake and sing happy birthday. And then a little while, a few months in, I figured out it wasn't a, a natal birthday. It wasn't about how long they've been alive. It had been about how long they've been sober. And that really freaked me out, because these people had multiple candles on their cake. And I was like, are you serious? Is that person? What? And then the slogan started coming. Well, yeah. We don't drink no matter what. Even if we want to, we don't have to. And we just keep coming back. And all these different things, one day at a time. And So I'm six and a half years old with the desire to not want to drink anymore. And, and the belief or understanding that I know what these slogans mean. I know what these cliches mean. And that I, I could somehow pull it off by just listening. Right? Just listening. They'll say things, little sarcastic things to us like, you got two ears and one mouth because you should be listening twice as much as you should be talking. It's like, okay, so then you don't say anything and you just listen until it's, you know, your time to share. And then everyone's telling these war stories at the groups that I was a part of. And so when they called on me, that's all I did was, okay, my time to tell a war story. And I had to top, you know, in my mind, I had to top the other person that just finished sharing what they had been through and what they had done and all that. So that's all I knew was basically to share my experience, weakness, and my despair because it's all I could transmit. And, uh... About eight and a half months in, you know, I'm, I'm two weeks away from taking that nine-month chip, and everyone knows, if you've been in enough meetings, a nine-month chip is the only thing standing in your way of making the approach towards that one year, you know. Is there anyone here who's never had a year of sobriety before? Right? And if you're anything like me, you might have the idea that if I can get a year of sobriety, everything else is going to get better, work itself out somehow, some way. I just need some distance from the last time I took a drink. A year, right? It seems like you're working towards it. So it's like these chips are geared towards giving that kind of hope. Six, you got 30, 60, and 90 days, and then six months, and then nine months, right? And I love them chips. I'm like, like I told you, I'm like a chipmunk, you know? <laughs> so I got about eight and a half months separated from booze and everything else, further than I'd ever been before, ever. And I could not have done it without the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't put more than maybe two days together on my own. Maybe once in a while, three days on my own. And if someone asked me, when was the last time I drank? I said, well, it's been like a week. And in my mind, you know, three days was like a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I saw the power of the fellowship. I, I, I got some, some kind of hope here. And I don't know if it's real hope or false hope, but I got some kind of hope by going to meetings. And uh, I was basically what a lot of us refer to as untreated. That means I didn't have anyone taking the time to take me through the 12 steps the way the book suggests. I didn't have any of that. I had a sponsor in name, and I picked this guy because he was Irish. Because in my mind, I needed a real alcoholic to help me. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I got preconceived ideas of what an alcoholic is. And the truth is, if there would have been a Native American in the home group that I went a part of, I would have picked his butt. Because I got ideas of what I think a real alcoholic is. And so I got this guy a sponsor and name and never did anything related to the steps of the book. And uh, the really only time I needed him was when I was going to drink. And uh, I was eight and a half months sober. The alley rats went, jumped off, and I went looting. Clean and sober. And uh, I don't know about you, but do you have any idea what an alcoholic will loot during riots? Alcohol. 26 cases of Bud, two dozen bottles of Cuervo, and then, of course, cartons and cartons and cartons and cartons of cigarettes. And so if I ever needed to make this call to someone, right, because they'll say things like, you better call your sponsor before you take a drink. And, you know, all these things I've been hearing time and time again at all of these meetings, they're just part of you after a while. So, okay, i got to make this call before I take a drink. And uh, I made that call. And, and it wasn't because I wanted to get loaded. It's because I didn't want to get loaded. So when I got the answer machine, I was able to hang up. Now, now here's the mind. Here's the mind. I already told you the physical part, what happens to me once I start. I can't stop. Here's the mind. The mind says, we're going to drink this. We're going to get good and, good and sloppy for a couple of weeks, and then we're just going to come right back and take a newcomer chip. It's not a big deal. Then I started thinking over, kind of screaming, well, maybe, maybe a month. Maybe a month. All right. You know. <laughs> well, if I'm going to start drinking, I'm going to do a whole bunch of other stuff, make it. Two months. <laughs> Two months, I'll take a newcomer chip, and then I should be golden again. Right? It's not a big deal. Because the idea was, if I have done it once, I can do it again. So let me tell you what happened after I took that drink. <laughs> Crack one open. Now, the idea is that I'm going to drink today, tomorrow, for a few weeks, two months tops, come right back, take a newcomer chip. So I put alcohol in my body. I didn't get sober for another five and a half years. I'm a chronic alcoholic. I actually experienced the phenomenon of craving. It's something real. It's not a theory. It's not some concept that the doctor created. It's something that I've experienced in my life. I cannot stop once I start. I don't know if it's going to be a week or a month. or Years go by by the time I'm able to come back. You know, my hat goes off to you if you can go out and come back over the weekend. Go out and come back the same calendar year. It's not my experience. I'm a chronic alcoholic. I do not know when I'm going to be able to stop once I start. So then I come back around, take chips all over again. Same damn cycle. No one taking the time to take me through the 12 steps the way the book suggests. But I accumulate more time. I get that 9-month chip. I even get a 14-month chip. I even got involved in a relationship. I don't know if I have time to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I went through a, a facility, dual diagnosed facility. And I, how did I end up there? I ended up there by way of these psychiatric hospitals and mental institutions. So I end up in this dual diagnosed place. And, uh, you know, it's funny talking to people who get diagnosed with schizophrenia, then you find out how much crystal meth they've been doing. It's <laughs> funny to talk to people who suffer from manic depression, and then you find out how much they drink. And it's interesting to find the other people that are in the middle that are diagnosed with bipolar, and you find out all the different mind altering substances that they've used to create that emotional roller coaster in mind. But the doctors, you know, will peg them with one thing so that they can treat it for whatever reason because they want to be helpful and useful. So I end up in this facility and I ended up talking to this girl who worked at this facility and a couple months in, we started hanging out, started talking, and then started, started with holding hands. And then it started with a kiss. And then it went from there. And so I went to meetings and, I, like I said, second time around, took a nine-month chip. Second time around, I even celebrated a, a, a birthday. You know, and I thought that was like, Thank you, thank you, thank you, look what I've done. I'm a meeting maker, and meeting makers make it, <laughs> you know, and all that sort of thing, you know, and uh, untreated, untreated, no one taking the time to take me through the 12 steps, no exposure to what the book outlines, no real exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous, and Alcoholics Anonymous comes from a book, so... 
about 14 months in, going to meetings, untreated. What happens to an untreated alcoholic after a period of time? This mental obsession, this idea that I have, this illusion, right? An illusion simply is a false perception of reality, right? Something that can deceive me or mislead me intellectually. The stars, Arizona must be beautiful at night if you can get to a place away from the city lights and you just look up at the stars. Some of those stars are illusions. I'm just looking up at the light where that star used to exist because it takes it thousands of years for it to reach Earth for me to see it. That's an example of an illusion, how something can trick my mind and me believing it's real. When I see it, it looks real. I'm not an astronomer. I can't tell you which stars are real, which ones aren't. But I just know some of those are illusion. Some of them aren't real. I'm just looking up at the place where that, where that star used to exist. But it may have built, burnt out thousands, if not millions of years ago. But the illusion that I suffer from is described in the book from approximately pages 23 to 43. It's all through the book, but it kind of narrows it down from approximately pages 23 to 43. It talks about my mind. My mind has the idea that the next time I drink, it's going to be different. The next time I drink, I'm going to control or enjoy it. And it's not the reality. The reality is I can't stop once I start. And there's nothing enjoyable about that. There's nothing controlling about that. And um, so me and this girl, I'm involved with, you know, I was with her for over a year. I must have got involved with her when I had maybe 90 days or so. And um, she seen me celebrate a year. And, you know, and I, you know, it's hard not to fall on the idea that my life's improving because I'm not drinking. Because there's no blackouts, there's no arrests, there's no no more hospitals, there's no more this, there's no more that. There's no more, a lot of that drama that's attached to some of our alcoholism. But there's still alcoholism. And uh, long story short, she's with me one day when I'm drinking. You know, I told her I was drinking again. And I'm about two months into my drinking again. And it's like I almost made her a drinking partner, but she was an alcoholic, so she didn't drink the way I did. Although she drank with me sometimes. One particular day she's drinking with me, um, or watching a movie, hanging out at my mom's. I tell her, let's, let's go over here. And there's this place that I knew. It was a, a bridge that crosses the Alley River. And the Alley River is basically a man river. It's just concrete. And um, there was this bridge, a train bridge that crossed it, not too far from where we were at. We drive over there. I don't know if I thought it'd be romantic, kind of secluded, see the stars and things. And uh, So we're there, and we took the bottle with us, and we continued to drink. And uh, we were there for, I don't know, an hour, if that. It's late. It's like 11 at night. And um, we stay there, fool around a little bit. Now we're getting ready to leave. And uh, I start to maneuver my way back over like this little rail that's supposed to like keep people out to the big trusses, the, those big large beams that support the bridge itself because the bridge is about 50 or 60 feet over the river itself, above the concrete. And so I have to maneuver over this little bar, back on this little, um, where the train tracks are. So I go first, coming out of where we were by the trussels, and I go first, and then I turn to see her following me, and she's not where she should be standing, so I kind of get concerned, and I, I walk over to the side of the embankment, and I look down, and um, what had happened, she had fallen, all the way down to the concrete below, and... Uh, I didn't have time to go all the way around, so what I do is I just hop over a little bar and kind of maneuver my way down the trusses itself, kind of like scale it. I get to her, and by the time I get to her, she's bleeding from her eyes, her ears, her nose, her mouth. And uh, when I pick her up, she gasps for air. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but you're not supposed to move someone with a head trauma. So... I pick her up, I carry her to the side of the embankment. She's a little too heavy for me to carry all the way up, so I lay her down gently. I grab her car keys, I drive to the nearest payphone, I call 911, told them what happened, hang up, call my mom, told her where, what happened, where I was at, hung up, drive back. By this time, the police and the ambulance are there. Um, they take, my mom shows up, police, they cuff me, they ask me questions, they release me to my mom, and then we drive to the hospital. And then I had to describe to her, her father and her mother and the rest of her friends and family what had happened. And uh, that would have been a perfect opportunity for me to look at drinking in a way where 
I can use this as a reason not to drink anymore. Here's someone I care about. Here's someone I was in love with. This is a woman that I saw every day, talked on the phone every day, and still wrote love letters to every day. And now here she is, hurt and injured because of this experience with drinking. That would have been a perfect opportunity to use that as, as, as an opportunity not to drink anymore. And some people can use an experience like that because she died two days later from her injuries. And why I couldn't use that as an opportunity to stop drinking is because I can't stop once I start to drink. And I had already been drinking. So I stayed loaded for another three and a half years, even with the desire not to want to drink anymore. So I don't know if you know what that's like to get drunk even when you don't want to get drunk. If you do, you're not alone because I've experienced that. I had the perfect reason not to drink anymore. I couldn't stop. And some hard drinkers that the book describes, all they need is something personal to them, and they can stop. They need a slap on the hand. Don't do that anymore. Sometimes it's losing a loved one. Sometimes it's a threat of losing a loved one. Sometimes it's uh, job security. Sometimes it's not being able to finish something they started. Sometimes it's homelessness. Sometimes it's being the third strike candidate, uh, you know, facing prison for the rest of your life or what. Some circumstances, the doctor says, you have a bad heart. You shouldn't be doing that anymore. You got a bad liver. You shouldn't be doing that anymore. And some people can just stop based on a sufficient reason, something personal to them. I could not. So then I ended up coming back and sober again, going to meetings three and a half years later. So my, my runs, my drunks are getting shorter, thank God. Um, and this time I ended up in a, in a, in a facility, you know, um, that dried me out. And I stayed in that facility for 15 months. And then I moved out into a sober living where I lived for four and a half years. And I come in and I'm just, you know, psychotic when I first get here. I'm not eating too well. I'm basically, I have to learn how to function as a person, as a human all over again. I learn how to have to be taught and learn how to sleep at night, how to um, stay awake during the day, how to eat breakfast, how to eat lunch, how to eat dinner. And then they, from this facility, they started driving us to 12 step meetings and stuff like that. And then I found someone who was willing to take the time to share the 12 steps with me. And so that's how my journey began 10 years ago. And, um, in the journey in the last 10 years, I've been exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous for the very first time from the book, from the literature, from the steps and the instructions and the directions that I've actually taken. And um, I believe, I believe from my experience that I do suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience can conquer. And the only proof I have to share with you about that is that for the 10 years that I've been here, separated from alcohol and all mind-altering substances, I've not taken any psychotropic medication. I'm not under a doctor's care. And I'm not in therapy. And everything happened really slow. I was on welfare for basically my first two and a half years of sobriety. I was paranoid for my first 18 months. My skin had like a grayish color for about a year and a half. Um, and then in the meantime, I asked someone to start to begin to take me through these, these steps in this process. And then by the time I get to inventory, by the time I take my fifth step, I don't have any more secrets. The stuff that happened to me as a child, because I'm an incest survivor, me, my older sister did things to me that no no person should do with their little brother, and um, so that was a secret. That came out in inventory, looked at it, and I got, what's interesting about that, what I can share related to those of you that are 12-step people, I got to see the part that I played in that. Although I was a victim the very first time that my older sister visited with me, what I got to see was taking a look at my selfishness and some dishonesty and some self-seeking and some fear where I'd actually begin to manipulate or blackmail my sister so that I can get what I wanted out of the deal. Because the first time she did it with me, I was a victim. But through inventory, I got to see that I was a victim that eventually became a volunteer. There was an effect that was produced by the things that my sister was doing with me and I chased with that effect. It produced something in me. And I'm an alcoholic that's willing to cause harm to anyone in order to feel better. Even if it's a member of my own family, it does not matter. I've done that. I've seen that through inventory and I share that on my fist that, and I get to see something like lust. How lust at times has been able to dominate me to the point where I'm willing to cause harm to someone. It doesn't matter if it's family or not. Just to satisfy my own selfish sexual needs and desire. So I get to a place, look at these things that I find objectionable. When I'm ready, say a prayer. Move to the next, right? Kind of sit with it, pause. Am I really ready to have these things removed? 
I can't do anything about them anyway because I do the same thing over and over again, over and over again, even when I don't want to. Say a prayer, some things get removed, then they have me make a list in, in the eighth step, and my inventory helps me make this list. And so in the ninth step, I go back to my sister for the harm that I caused her, for the way I used her just to make myself feel better. And I go back to the parents of the woman who died from that bridge. Not because I killed her, not because I caused her death, but there was definitely a part that I played in her passing. And so I had to go back and look them in the face and stand, and, and stand in their home and acknowledge the part that I played in their daughter passing. And each time I make an amends, each time I made an amends during that past the steps, my faith grew. I saw this power work in my life. It did things for me that I wasn't willing to do. I was not willing to go back to the parents of that girl. I, that's like it, it, that's like admitting that I killed her. I wasn't willing to do that until I'm redirected, taking a look at the book, and then it's right there in black and white. In the beginning, somewhere in this process, I I was willing to go to any lengths for a spiritual experience. So there's no choice in what I have to do with these steps. I'm either going to do them or I'm not. I'm either an alcoholic or I'm not. I either have to follow the 12 suggestions or I'm not. So there's no middle of the road for me. So I come from a place of willing and desperation only because of my alcoholism and knowing the fact that I have this mind that has a condition that can drive me back to drink in any given moment. And that my only hope is a spiritual defense that I'm developing along the way this process. It's like I get pulled and pushed through these steps. Alcohol brings me here, drives me here, and then this power kind of pulls me, pulls me along to the next step, to the next phase of development. And so in the ninth step, as I make these amends, my faith begin to grow. I've been to every single store that I've shoplifted or, or robbed in three different states. And I've been to all the people that, like I said, I grew up in Los Angeles, gang culture is part of it, and so I got in gunfights, I've been in stabbings, I've been in jail, I've been in riots. I've been back and having to find people that there's no way for me to find. People that I maybe went to elementary school with for the first grade. And along this path, there's I just hit these walls where he's moved, he's gone, don't know where he went. And then maybe one day I'm visiting my mom, saying hello, and I'm, I'm down the street at a grocery store, and there he is walking across the parking lot. I've seen this power work in my life where there's no other explanation that this power is working and that it's real. I made all of my amends the very first time, and it took me over five and a half years to do it. It's possible. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called deep and effective spiritual experiences. And I've had one as a result of all 12 steps. I get to a place where after amends or, or halfway through amends, they'll show me about prayers, they'll show me different forms of meditation, and they'll show me how I can start my day and how I can end my day. They're like book uh, bookends. There's one in the beginning and one in the end, and everything in the middle. There's a step for that that I can take with me. And I'm getting a little bit better at 10 step. Um, the 11 step, the questions, the review, the taking the time to set aside for meditation, silent meditation, I dig that. That's not what the... The old guys did back in the 30s, with, they had no Eastern thought. Their, their, their form of meditation was focused thought one thing at a time. They did silent time. They did quiet time. They would write out their ideas or thoughts that they thought came from God and then weigh it and question it with the four absolutes and things like that. I've had it my second time through the pass of the steps. I had experiences with some of that stuff and some of that mechanics. Second time pass of the steps, I ended up in my first apartment. And, um, you know, I, I come basically got sober. Um, in South Central Los Angeles, and then moved into my first apartment uh, about a thousand feet from the Pacific Ocean in the city of Malibu. I don't know if you know anything about California, but South Central Los Angeles and Malibu are two different worlds. <laughs> <laughs> but it happened as a result of the work that I was doing on the inside. These steps cleaned me from the inside out. You know, kind of like a, a jack o' lantern. You know, it's, all, it's Halloween weekend. It's like God cuts me open reaches in, moves all that guck out, puts a smile on my face, puts a light inside of me, and sends me out in the world. <laughs> That's it. You know, the life that I have is not something that I created. The life that I've been given from the inside out is not something that I manifested or that I made happen. It came to me without any effort or thought on my part. I went through the steps, and I ended up at this place. 
I ended up at a place where someone invited me out to Arizona to share my story and, and give this talk to tell you that there is a way out. No matter how dark it's been, no matter what secret you may be holding, someone else has the same secret. Someone else has a darker secret, perhaps. It's all perception. Anybody can get well here. Anybody. And that's the secret that a lot of us don't talk about. We don't stay sick. We can't. But if I do, it's because I'm not interested in getting well. I've been over, able to move through and be pushed through the defect or character defect or flaw or the thing that I find objectionable like lust. I don't look at women in Alcoholics Anonymous the same way I did 10 years ago or even six months ago to tell you the truth. This guy that's taken me through the steps now, this is my fourth pastor. He's a, a Buddhist practitioner. The first time I was taken through the steps was by a Muslim. I'm just sharing this with uh, Jeff. And I didn't plan this. First guy who took me through the steps was a, a, a man who had a, a who was Muslim. Second time I was taken through the steps was by a guy who was Jewish. Third passed through the steps by was was by a Christian. And now a Buddhist is working with me. Something with some of their practices has to do with love and compassion, and some of that he's able to share it or transmit it to me using the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's a it's an amazing thing. So one of the things or considerations that he gave to me about about women. You just think about them as mother, as your mother. So I look at you and I see, okay, that's my mother in, in her teens. Oh, that's my mother in her 20s. Oh, that's oh, that's my mother when she was cute, when she was 24 or 25. So it's, it's all the women now are becoming my mother because, you know, m women are creators, co-creators and that sort of thing. So it's just a simple thought, simple idea, and it's been useful for me, you know. And there's been power that I've been able to turn to in order to hold that thought and hold that idea and, and hold that consideration so that it manifests in the way I treat women. I treat them as I would treat my mother. I don't hit on my mother. I don't flirt with my mother. Although, I think a lot of guys have. I've grabbed my mom's blood and shit like that. I mean, <laughs> but uh, just a consideration that to treat with the... Uh, they're not just for my gratification. They're not just to make me feel good. That they're, they're people, they're entities, they're breathing living things that have powerful roles here on this planet. And um, that's the new place that I've been moved to. Um, meditation is something I enjoy because it's simple. Meditation for me in its simplest form is focusing on one thing at a time, one thought. And for me, meditation, what I appreciate about it is I can focus on my breath. And when I can focus on my breath and pay attention only to that, I can actually begin to control the way I breathe. And what's interesting that I've noticed that when I begin to control the way I breathe, I can actually then begin to control the way I think. And so with my 10-step practice and with my 11-step practices, for the past over, I was talking to Jeff, over 150-something days, I may have only not done my practice twice in the last 150-something days, I've been able to rely absolutely on my mind. And that's been amazing. That's been beautiful. I get to rely on my mind and, and use inspirational thought and use, use things like intuition. Of course, that, that little instinct that's quiet that tells you what way to go, what to say and how to say it, or what to do and what not to do. I've been paying very close attention to that intuitional thought, and it's been lovingly, and it's open. It's opened me up, and it's free flowing. And I just really like this town and the state, and I've just been feeling the vibe here. You know, there's to me a lot of it feels like a camaraderie, like a family-oriented community like a loving energy, and I just feel good because I'm able to practice and share that also. So I feel like I can be a part of this thing too out here and just, just to hang out and fellowship with you guys this weekend. I'm honored. Um, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to be invited here to connect and to... Um, participate in this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm honored that young folks of Arizona who put on this conference were interested in hearing what I had to say about my experience and with this process. Um, I've seen these steps allow me to access power in a way that I've never been able to access before. And like I said, you know, not only on the inside, but outside stuff. I moved into my own apartment. I bought a car finally. I was, how old was I? Twenty something. I was. I bought the car seven years ago for six hundred dollars, and it still runs. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, there's money in the bank, I have a credit card. Um, when I was 19 years old, I got a 16-year-old girl pregnant. Um, I was there, I got to see the child being born. And it, as a beautiful, miraculous experience is that one is seeing childbirth and creation and God and in the midst of all that, that didn't keep me sober. But because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the talks that I had a relationship with that boy, with that son, I was there the day he was born. I've been there sporadically throughout his life in the first few years because I was still drinking. But when I finally got sober 10 years ago, I still wasn't in the position to be much of a father. I had to really pay close attention to what's offered me here with the steps. And so I just figured, you know, wherever these steps take me, if it can allow me to be whatever I'm supposed to be, if I'm supposed to be a father, if I'm supposed to be a better son, if I'm supposed to be, you know, a, a decent uncle or, or a good grandson and things like that, I've been afforded opportunities to be of service to family. You know, finally, like I said, after my first two and a half years of being on welfare, I started to go to work and I started to you know, pay bills. And then I started to pay that child support that I got behind on. And I think, you know, they suspend your license when you're not paying child support. So they gave me my license back. And then a few years ago, I got a commercial driver's license and little things like that. And um, um, it's interesting. But over the years, I've shared some of this program with this with this child of mine. He knows the serenity prayer. And he can actually sit still and do a five-minute meditation with me. And he's done that since he was 13 years old. And um, two months ago, his mom married a few years ago. She married a man who joined the service, and they got stationed in Hawaii. So I was like, right when we're starting to spend more time together and develop, it's like circumstances have separated us from again. Although we do use the phone and though we do use the mail, um, something came to me out of meditation, and it said, why don't you go surprise your boy for his 15th birthday? Wouldn't that be neat? And, you know, and it was like, his, his birthday was like a week away, and I had things going on at work, things going on that I needed to, and it just says, yeah, what if I did? So, uh, and it came out of a meditation, it came out of prayer, and uh, so I asked my boss, what if she thought if I can take, you know, this day and this day off, blah, 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 and combine it with the two days that I have off from work, and, and then I looked financially, I couldn't do it, but I have a piece of plastic that you could put things on, so I figured, hey, why not? And so I considered it, and then I ended up actually doing it. And so I asked his mom for permission first to come out and visit and surprise him. And she's, my mind said she's going to shut this down. She just, she said, send me the money instead or something like that. And my mind's just all twisted, has its ideas of what it thinks it knows. And uh, she thought it was a great idea. And so I did. I flew out there for four days, and everything was on me. You know, I never had paid for something like that where it, I got the room, I got the car, and all kinds of stuff. And uh, a little neat story about that trip. I, I was only out there for four days in, in Honolulu, but I went to a, a morning meeting, 7 o'clock in the morning. And, and uh, you know, like a lot of meetings, they ask any people from out of town, things like that. So I raised my hand, you know, from LA, California. All right, you're our 20 minute speaker then. We, got, we would like for you to share. <laughs> we would like for you to share about the, 12, uh, about the first step. So, boom, here I go. Okay, I could do that. So, talked about all that. And then, um, all the people that were involved with the 12 steps, the mechanics of it, they shared right after me. And it was like, I had lit a little fire and the people were excited and yeah, man, you know, I'm in inventory now. And, and they shared a little bit about this. Another person talked about amends. Another person talked about the 10th step, the 11th step and how it all related back to the first step being physically, mentally, and spiritually sick from this condition. And, uh, it was great. And then I met this man who was at this meeting who happened to be a, a surf instructor at Waikiki. And this woman thought it was a good idea to go talk to him. And maybe I can go take my son for a surf lesson. And so I just kind of followed this woman's suggestions. Okay, I'll go talk to him. I'll go see what he says. And he agreed. And he's, he's just, his attitude was real simple. It's like any friend of Bill's is a friend of mine. So uh, I, went to, I went to go pick up my son from high school, told him to grab his swim trunks. And uh, that afternoon, we went surfing at Waikiki. And uh, that was a, a little memory that I, I was able to create because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the suggestions that I took. And um, being willing and able to, to follow through with that. There's power that I have now in my life where there was no power before. Um, and then, of course, the paradox is it's not, my, it's not my power. The paradox is it's within me, but it's not from me. This isn't mine. It's what I've accessed because of the 12-step process. It's taken me on a journey from the inside out. And um, so that's just little something that I remember that I can share with current experiences and, and what it looks like in real life. Um, 
probably spend the next year paying for the trip, but it was worth it to see the surprise on my son's face when that Saturday when I showed up and I rang the doorbell and he answered the door. That was just was priceless. Plus, you know, the little surfing memory that all that we created, we took pictures. And just the other day, I sent the picture to him with a, a letter from the heart. And, and it came out of a place of prayer and meditation. And some of the things that I talked about, I wasn't sure if I should be able or willing to talk about them because I talked about the fact that because of my selfishness that I had actually brought him into this world without being married to his mother. And that I know that that has not been easy to be separated from your father and the distance that we have from each other. So just connecting to him on a different level, just seeing him and understanding him as his own entity, even though he's my son, even though he's my flesh and blood, that's not all he is. He's actually a child of God and he has his own thoughts, his own process, and that he's his own little entity. And he, I'm just like the vehicle that brought him here. That's it. But he's his own little person. And, and as I would say someone new that I'm working with that I'm taking through the 12 steps, the little bit that I've been given as a man on this planet for 35 years is the little bit that I'm able to share with him in a, in a real, gentle, loving way. I don't bash people with the book anymore. I don't attack them with this and that. This is A, this is not. I let people have their experiences, and I'm just more compassionate, and I've been relying on this intuitive thought. So look for the things, what to say and how to say them. And I've been using that and practicing that with my son. And just like those of us who work with new people and take others through the steps, a lot of working with people is just being able to listen, to find out where they're at, and to find out how it can be useful and helpful. And so I've been doing that with my son, too, and it's been tremendous. He's been sharing things with me and disclosing things to me so that I get to know him a little bit better and, and vice versa. And it's just this, this exchange, this exchange, kind of like the exchange with the, with, the, with the sponsor and the new person. The sponsor's sharing something with you that you've never had before, and then you're also helping the sponsor grow because he's, he's, he's getting so much more by giving. So it's just this, this dance that we have. And I had that dance with new men in this fellowship, and actually... It's, that's changed too because now I've, I've just a few days ago I started to work with women my first woman I spoke at a a veterans facility and I'm going to be working with the United States Marine you know which is amazing because um, a lot of harm that I caused in my life in the streets I felt guilty about the freedom that I misused I have a grandfather who served in the Vietnam War and I carried a lot of guilt and shame about the way I treated my freedom, took it, took it for granted as an American. And I always look for ways of what I can do to make it right. And at this particular meeting, one woman who served says, keep doing what you're doing. Continue to share your experience and be willing to work with people. And then two days later, or a day later, one of the women from that facility called me up and asked me if I'd be willing to help her. And usually this facility, it's an all-women's facility, they don't allow any men to work with them. But they're going to make an exception. They're going to try this out. So we're both kind of looking forward to this partnership. And um, it's just an opportunity. That's all it is. It's just another opportunity to be able to share with another living person what Alcoholics Anonymous truly has to offer. Bottom line, my selfishness is, is the fact that I'm just grateful that I don't have the obsession anymore. I don't have the obsession to drink. I don't suffer from the idea that the next time I drink, I'm going to control and enjoy it. That idea is gone, and it's been lifted, and it's been replaced with this God idea. And the only reason I'm not drunk today is because of the grace of God. That's the beginning and the end of my recovery, with the grace of God. And the 12 steps just allow me freedom from me, and my mind, and what it is I think I want, because of the things that drive me from my selfishness and self-centeredness. Being driven by fear and self-seeking and self-delusion. These are things that I continue to go through the steps to have them removed so that I could continue to be useful and effective with other people in family, at work, and here in the fellowship, you know. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.